I'm calling uh, this morning's message, Peace and Joy for Christmas. Peace and Joy. Two words strongly associated with the Christmas season. We read them on Christmas cards. We see them in Christmas decorations. Sometimes you'll see them around town, up in lights. And we sing them in some of our most beloved carols. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Or think of the words of Hark the Herald Angels saying, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Peace and joy. We, we see these words, we hear them, we sing them, and sometimes we even feel them in our hearts at Christmas. And there's a very good reason why peace and joy are so closely associated with Christmas. Both of these words and both of these emotions or habits of the heart appear very prominently in the stories of the first Christmas. And we see this in the Gospel of Luke, which has been the focus of our studies for chapel this, this fall semester. Peace is an easy one. When a great company of the heavenly host appeared to the shepherds who were watching over their flocks in the hill country of Judea, as was sung for us from Handel's Messiah, these angels came pronouncing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom God is well pleased. Those words were spoken in kindness to the first shepherds who were frightened half to death to see such holy angels, but they were also announcing a new era in human history. God was coming, not in judgment, but in peace, in sending his beloved son into the world. He was bringing his peace to troubled humanity. And the angels were not the only ones who received this message of peace, and the, the shepherds were not the only ones who heard it. Zechariah sang about it in his Christmas carol, his Benedictus, a prophecy given when his son, John the Baptist, was born. By the inspiration of the Spirit, Zechariah knew that a Savior was coming, and as he came to the end of his carol, he announced that this Savior would give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zechariah's song ended with a blessing of shalom. And Simeon sang about this as well. Old, old Simeon waiting for one last thing before he died. All he wanted was just one glimpse of the Savior that God had promised. And when Simeon saw the Son of God in the arms of Mother Mary, he felt the deep peace of the first Christmas. And already as we're reading the Gospel of Luke, we understand this Gospel is not just a drama, it's actually a musical. And so you can almost hear the pit orchestra begin to take up the strains as Simeon sings another one of the first Christmas carol, carols, the, the peaceable carol, which the ancient church called the Nunc Dimittis. Sovereign Lord, this is Luke chapter 2 at verse 29. As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. You see, there is a very good reason why we talk about peace at Christmas. It's because of what God has promised in the incarnation of the Son of God. Peace on earth, peace with God, peace among the nations, peace in the face of death, peace for everyone who receives Jesus by faith. Peace and also joy. This term as well, strongly present in the opening chapters of Luke. This, this happy emotion was also an essential aspect of the first Christmas. It was there in the birth announcement that the angels pronounced, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And to make sure that we catch the right mood and enter fully into the joy of Christmas, this theme was already introduced in chapter 1. It's there when the priest Zechariah learns that a son will be born to him, the forerunner of the Savior, John the Baptist. The, the angel says to him, you will have joy and gladness, and many 
will rejoice at his birth. It's a birth announcement for John that goes before the birth announcement for Jesus, partly to set the tone for the first Christmas. And Zachariah's wife Elizabeth felt this joy as well. Old Elizabeth, long barren and yet now expecting miraculously a baby boy. And when her cousin Mary came for a visit carrying the Christ in her womb, the child inside Elizabeth made a sudden motion. And Elizabeth said to Mary, behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. There's that word again. And it was the experience of John the Baptist in the womb. He too entered into the joy of the first Christmas. And John, uh, Luke, I think, is doing something more here than setting the mood for us. He is inviting us to enter in. The association of peace and joy with Christmas is not sentimental. It's not nostalgic. It's not arbitrary or superficial. It is core to the gospel message of the miraculous conception and virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Peace on earth, good news of great joy. These messages are meant for us, and so is the emotional experience that goes with them. There is peace and there is joy for you this Christmas. This Christmas? Christmas 2020? Will there really be peace for us and joy? I'm calling this talk Peace and Joy for Christmas, but maybe you could put a question mark at the end of that phrase, because peace and joy are just about the last two words that anyone would use to describe anything associated with 2020. I started our chapel series earlier this fall with a lament. There was nothing joyful about it or peaceful. Now it's December and we are still grieving for the same sad losses now that we were grieving back then. Sickness and death, financial hardship, isolation and separation, racial conflict, unjust violence. There's nothing peaceful about seeing an ICU crowded with patients Nothing joyful about the experience people have of seeing their loved ones die alone. Nothing peaceful about politics and protests. Nothing peaceful about arguing over when and where you do or don't need to wear a mask. Now, when we describe COVID-19 and try to explain what happened before, during, and after the 2020 elections in this country, I don't suppose that the words peace and joy show up anywhere in the conversation. It, it's words like sadness, fear, grief, anxiety, anger, frustration. What hope can we have of peace and joy this Christmas? I think it's worth remembering that the world has always been like this. When the angels sang joy to the world, and when Mary and Zechariah prophesied peace, many troubled souls would have doubted. The godly people that we meet in the stories of the first Christmas were all living in poverty. Mary and Joseph certainly were, and so, of course, was their newborn son lying in a manger. Soon they would be homeless immigrants, fleeing for their lives from Herod's murderous assault on the newborn babies of Judea. The Roman Empire was violent and oppressive. Israel was military-occupied territory. The Jews were victims of religious persecution, of racial injustice. And all of the things that righteous people are fighting for in our world today, freedom of religion, the right to life, food for the hungry, housing for the homeless, racial reconciliation, an end to unjust violence. These things were so uncommon in those days that people were nearly powerless to fight for them. What peace can there be? What joy can we experience in a world so divided and damaged by sin? And what hope do we have of forgiveness? In all of our concern about physical health and racial conflict, we must never forget that the greatest enemy of peace and joy is our separation from God because of our transgression. This is the source, ultimately, of all our worry, sadness, and alienation. And so I repeat, what hope for us is there 
of peace and joy this Christmas. Now, Luke the Evangelist had the answer to that question, but you have to read all the way to the end of the story to get it. If you want to see how God makes good on the promise of peace and the promise of joy for those with whom, with whom he is well pleased, with those on whom his, for those on whom his favor rests, you have to read all the way to the end of the Gospel of Luke. And I'm sure you've noticed this in your liberal arts studies, how the best stories find a way of ending in a way that echoes the beginning. There is a sense of completion, of wholeness, of having arrived at the right conclusion. And here I want to show you something brilliant and beautiful in the way that Luke has written his gospel. Peace and joy. These words from the beginning of the gospel show up prominently and climactically at the end of the gospel. Luke uses this technique to bring the story to full circle and show us that God will give us and has given us what he promised to give us at the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now you'll remember, I'm sure, how the gospel ends. The last thing the disciples knew, Jesus was dying on the cross in terrible agony. And then at the end of chapter 23, he is laid in a tomb and all of their hosts, hopes seem to be lost. There is no peace, no joy, only sorrow and trouble. And as the disciples gathered to grieve, they began to hear this strange news that the Lord, and this is the phrase that is used in Luke 24, the Lord has risen indeed. And suddenly, as they were trying to understand what this meant, Jesus appeared to them, not as a baby in a manger, but as glorious Lord, risen bodily from the grave. And Jesus said the same thing to his disciples that the angels had announced to the shepherds, to the disciples who had abandoned Jesus at the cross, who were now scared half out of their minds because they thought they were seeing a ghost. The first things that, thing that Jesus says to them is peace, peace to you. This is more than merely a polite greeting. It is a pronouncement of divine shalom. And it's a peace not only for the first disciples as forgiven sinners, it is also for us. We have peace with God because through the cross, our transgressions are forgiven. We have peace in the world in spite of all the anxiety and fear that we may experience. We have peace with one another because by the Holy Spirit, Jesus has been born in us and has made his home with us. Peace not coming simply through the baby in the manger, but through the Savior who died on the cross and the Lord who rose from the dead with the power of eternal life. Peace and also joy. At first, the disciples could hardly believe what they were seeing. Jesus, who they knew beyond doubt was dead, now alive from the dead and standing in front, of, in front of them. Luke says that they were startled. This is chapter 24, verse 37, and frightened and thought they saw a ghost. And Jesus did not want them to be troubled or doubtful. He wanted them to be peaceful and joyful. And so he invited them to touch the glorified scars in his hands and feet to experience for themselves the resurrection of his body, which would never die again. And Luke uses a strange expression to describe what the disciples felt in those first moments of encountering the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is chapter 24, verse 41, in a way echoing chapters one and two, they disbelieved for joy. They disbelieved for joy. You know, in English, when something happens that seems so, too good to be true, we, we say, I can't believe it. Actually, we, we can believe it or we're, we're starting to believe it, but it's just such amazing good news that we can hardly believe it. Augustine, in his comments on this passage, said that while the disciples were still flustered for joy, they were seeing and touching and scarcely believing. If anything seems too good to be true, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
which means that all of our sins, every last one of them is forgiven and that we are totally at peace with our awesome and holy God and that we have the absolute assurance of everlasting life, of the resurrection of our own bodies. This is not something to disbelieve, it is something to believe for joy, a joy that drives away our doubts and comforts all of our sorrows. I don't know how you will experience it, in what precise moment over this Christmas season you will, you will feel the joy and have the peace. It, it will come perhaps as you read some familiar scripture, as you ponder the lyrics of some new carol that gives us fresh perspective on the coming of Christ into the world. But this Christmas, 2020, by faith, you will encounter the incarnate, crucified, risen, Lord Jesus Christ, unbelievable joy will come into your life, indescribable peace, peace and joy for Christmas, peace and joy forever. Amen.